very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the media, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. The government of Trinidad and Tobago has recently, in response to a very vexing state of affairs in the country, indicated that the business of the theft of copper and its implications for our assets, including security <clears throat> assets in the country, must be treated as a very serious national security issue. The government formulated certain responses to that issue. In consequence, the Attorney General and I have come before you now to give you an indication as to the state of affairs and the very present state of the government's reaction to it. As is well known, the purchase and export of copper and other metals is by now known to have been perpetrated by some unlawful operators as well as in the normal course of affairs by the legitimate scrap iron industry, a legitimate industry operating for many years in Trinidad and Tobago. But within recent times, as we all know, there has been some very untoward developments affixing itself to this industry, so to speak, that is creating a lot of the issues for us. Copper and copper prices have become particularly and greatly in demand around the world. And it is perhaps for that reason the prices have soared and it is attracting the kind of business and activity of which we complain in Trinidad and Tobago. According to the Trinidad and Tobago Central Statistical Office, scrap metal exports escalated from approximately 69 million TT dollars in 2009 to some 216 million in 2018 registering an increase of over 213% over 10 years. And it also recognizes that the price of copper runs at about 15,000 Trinidad and Tobago dollars per ton. Locally, since 2010, the scrap iron industry has grown rapidly, contributing to over U.S. 260 million in 2021 to the country's gross domestic product, despite the overall impact of COVID-19 on most industries overall. As I indicated to, as I indicated earlier, criminal activity has now seeped into this industry in a very serious way, and it cannot escape the attention of the government in the protection of the affairs of Trinidad and Tobago. A major incident actually occurred on July the 30th, 2022, where unknown persons cut and stole TSTT's fiber optic and copper cables from a major telecommunications artery in cross-crossing San Fernando, interrupting mobile internet and fixed line and cable service to tens of thousands of customers throughout the country. Approximately 500 meters of underground cable, underground cable was vandalized with losses estimated at about 1 million Trinidad and Tobago dollars. On Tuesday, June the 26th, 2022, a report was made to the police by a representative of the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago 
that due to reports of disruption in services, a check was made at its repeater one station at Hamilton Trace, Kaship Village in Maruga. Upon arrival, it was discovered that the facility was broken into and a quantity of batteries, copper wires, and fittings that were attached to electrical equipment, as well as the DVR for the camera, were missing, totaling something like losses to the extent of about $115,000. On the 31st of July, 2022, a report of cable vandalism to the underground cables. So they're going underground to find them from the telecommunication services of Trinidad and Tobago occurred. And this interrupted telephone, mobile, and internet services in parts of South Trinidad. And I've already made reference to the incident at Cross Crossing. On the 2nd of August, a supervisor of the Ministry of Works and Transport reported to the Karani police that he visited the ministry's Karani location and upon checking discovered fabricated iron beams and steel pipes which were used in the construction of inspection sheds at the licensing office in Port of Spain was missing. The value of these items estimated at about $1 million and of course Inquiries were conducted by the police visiting a certain company located in central Trinidad off the Uriah Butler Highway. And these are the premises of a scrap iron dealer where the items that were missing were found. And the owner of the establishment was arrested and charged for receiving those stolen items. In the Port of Spain district, in August, the Belmont Police Station received a report from an employee of a radio communication, a number of them, and they experienced disruptions in their services. And upon arrival at the site, it was discovered that 60 feet of copper cable and two three bay standby antennas valued at about 300,000 missing. And when it comes to communication systems, it's not simply the actual value of the thing as you would imagine. It disrupts communication and which is in some ways the lifeblood of an economy in very serious ways. Those are just some of the examples of what we have had to cope with, resulting in the police Crime and Problem Analysis Branch being able to reveal that in 2020 there were 58 reports of that kind of activity and 30 persons arrested. In 2021, 87 reports, 52 persons arrested. Between January and August the 8th of 2022, 162 reports 136 persons arrested, altogether 218 persons arrested for offenses in relation to the kind of activity I've just described. You know, we have 7,000 roughly members of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. We have over 10,000 lampposts around Trinidad and Tobago, over 10,000. We have hundreds of facilities owned and managed by WASA and by TN Tech. We have cable all over this country. We have thousands of gates, <clears throat> metal fences. Somebody is obviously buying these bits of material and somebody is actually selling them. We observed a report in one of the newspapers where this is referred to as vandalism. This is not vandalism. It is to feed an industry. It is theft. It is serious criminal conduct. Theft. And it is severely disruptive. 
we do not generate steel and copper in Trinidad and Tobago. We import it, we use it in the assets that we operate. And of course, in the days when the scrap iron truck would go around and take up little bits of disused material here and there, virtually cleaning up the place and disposing of it in whatever way, even in exporting it, that was all good. But the thing has now morphed into something far more sinister, where the criminals, criminal gangs, operating internationally, are now converting live, useful, serving assets into scrap to fuel the money-making of which we descri described. And therefore, the government is obliged to take a very serious view of this. And I would like to pass you on now to the Attorney General, who will tell you what we have done and what we propose to do in treating with this, what has now amounted to a very serious national security threat and issue. Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. The Minister has recounted in brief a very significant crisis that is facing us in Trinidad and Tobago. He ended by referring to what appears to be an illicit business that is converting live, useful, money-making assets into scrap. What we have been experiencing in Trinidad and Tobago for the last, I think, four months has been an escalation of an unlawful activity, series of activities in the field of what used to be and we expect and hope will continue to be a legitimate and important industry in this country, the scrap metal industry. The government recognizes that there are very many people who earn a living from the collection and storage and export of scrap metal. It is a very legitimate, vastly important industry to the man in the street, men and women, families depend on it. But what we have been experiencing in Trinidad and Tobago of late seeks to abuse what is a legitimate industry to make it into a criminal enterprise that has assumed proportions that now take on a serious national security dimension. <clears throat> and it is why we have asked you to come here today under the aegis of the Honorable Minister of National Security because the problem cannot be ignored and as many arrests as have been made, and the Minister has given you some of those statistics, the law enforcement ability to arrest this challenge needs to be buttressed, it needs to be reinforced by giving the country a proper regulatory, and by regulatory I mean legislative and regulatory framework within which we can bring this crisis under control. The men in, and women in the street will recognize the scourge that this criminal event has brought upon us. We are on a regular basis finding that we have no lights in our homes. We have no cellular phone access. Our very national security infrastructure in the public utilities is being undermined by the theft of copper and other very important metals, ferrous and non-ferrous metals, which are the lifeblood of our 
infrastructure that produce our electricity, that produce our communications. And what we have been experiencing in the last several months has been a wanton assault on our national security infrastructure at the levels that are unprecedented. I will not bore you with the details of the record. Suffice it to say that in early July, the Cabinet appointed a subcommittee consisting of Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, Mr. Stuart Young, who is also Minister of Energy, the Minister of National Security, Honorable Minister Hines, who I have the privilege to be with here today, the Minister of Trade and Industry, Senator Paula Gopi Schoon, and myself to undertake a review of the threat that is threatening to overwhelm us. And we were asked to conduct that review and to report urgently to the Cabinet, which we did. We did that by a series of consultations. We met with the Scrap Dealers Association, Mr. Ferguson. We met with other persons. We have written to a number of persons. The Minister of Trade and Industry has herself penned letters to different enterprises across the industry, across the country. And we have invited correspondence and representations from a number of critical businesses and industries across the country. And the results of that have been quite alarming. As a result of that, the Cabinet Subcommittee reported to the Cabinet that the situation required urgent short-term action so as to enable the government to bring the crisis under control. And as a result of those recommendations, I have given certain advice to the Cabinet. Arising out of that advice, Cabinet met on Thursday last week, the 11th of August and took certain decisions. The first decision that was taken, and I refer in particular to the Cabinet minute of that meeting, was to accept the recommendations of the Attorney General in paragraph 13 of the Cabinet note that had been taken to Cabinet, and paragraph 13 of that Cabinet note spelt out that Cabinet authorized the preparation of a prohibition order pursuant to Section 44 of the Customs Act to ban the exportation of old scrap metal and scrap metal generally. For the making of that order by signature of the Secretary, which is allowed under Section 32 of the Interpretation Act, for the urgent preparation of amendments to the export exporters negative list of the Ministry of Trade and for the urgent preparation of a regulatory and licensing framework by the Ministry of Trade in consultation with the Ministry of the Attorney General and Ministry of Finance. As a result of that, on Friday the 12th of August, the prohibition order was issued and I will read that prohibition order so that we can all be very clear. And that prohibition order, I have to tell you, took effect on Friday the 12th of August, and it is now in effect. And it will last for six months until the 23rd of February, 2023. And by that order, one, the exportation of old metal is prohibited except by manufacturers licensed by the Minister with responsibility for trade to export all material as a byproduct of manufacturing goods or a surplus material not required for manufacturing them. And old metal and scrap metal are defined in that order which took effect on the 12th of August. So there is now in effect a six month ban on the exportation of all old metal and scrap, scrap metal, which makes violators subject to fine and imprisonment. I took a further recommendation to the Cabinet recognizing that the industry is a legitimate 
thriving industry and that even six months is a long time. I took a recommendation to the cabinet which was accepted and that recommendation reads as follows. That cabinet accepted and agreed that within three months of 12th of August as Attorney General I will bring a further note for the consideration of Cabinet with a review and analysis of the current legislation pertaining to the old metals industry together with re a review of regional and international legislation in that regard and to make recommendations with respect to specific amendments to existing regulations and amendments. So the short point is we have effected a six-month ban on exportation but it is the hope that with the hard work of the Law Reform Commission and the Chief Parliamentary Council of the Office of the Attorney General, I can return to Cabinet within three months to put in place a legislative and regulatory system which will enable the ban to be shorter than three months because we will be building out a legislative, regulatory and enforcement process that will put an end to what is now a thriving, illegal, and illicit industry which is crippling this country. And may I emphasize that to the extent that the Cabinet formed the subcommittee which I spoke of in early July, Cabinet has seen it fit to keep that, su that subcommittee in place, to work with the Minister of Trade and Industry so that even though the Minister of Trade and Industry is permitted to give licenses within that period for certain types of materials which would otherwise be banned by the six-month ban, the Cabinet Subcommittee will work with the Minister of Trade and Industry so that that ministry is not put under undue pressure as a single ministry in its own right by persons who would wish to unduly lobby for licenses under the regime. So licenses that will be applications for licenses that will be coming into the ministry will be reviewed by the subcommittee which includes the Minister of Trade and Industry, the Minister of National Security, Minister of Energy and myself as Attorney General before any such licenses are granted. Our intention is to keep the legitimate industry alive but to keep it under constant review over the six-month period so that there will be no loopholes through which any illicit undertakings will continue. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very reluctant decision that the Cabinet came to. We have attempted to keep it within proportion, that is to say, within a short period of time, six months to February the 23rd, and to allow for an even shorter period of three months if the Attorney General is able to persuade the Cabinet in three months that we have drafted a regulatory free framework that will allow the industry to resume export. It is a regrettable step that has been taken, but it is a step that has been taken because we recognize that it is affecting the livelihoods of ordinary people who would otherwise be earning a, leg a legitimate income from this industry and it is also affecting ordinary people in how they go about their lives, their daily communications and very importantly it is affecting the national security apparatus of the country. So we thought we would call you all here today to announce the fact of that six month ban and to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members of the media as suggested by the Attorney General, we are now available to you to take questions in relation to this matter. Morning, afternoon, sorry. Um, Terry and Ron Campbell from TTT News. Could you, um, Attorney General, tell us about the um, fines and imprisonment for the flouting of the ban, please? I'm, I'm not sure if I understood. You said the fines and the you spoke of fines and imprisonment. Yes, the, it's a very old legislation, which is one of the things that we have to review. So the, the old legislation that is currently regulating the framework within which this situation is dealt with 
is uh, the Old Metal and Marine Stores Act and uh, the Trade Ordinance. Under the Old Metal and Marine Stores Act, Section 10, and it, it is, when I read it, um, it will tell you this is a piece of legislation that was passed in 1904 and has been amended in a very minimal way since then. Section 10 tells us anybody, any person who does or omits anything which is by this act forbidden or required to be done, or who assaults, resists, opposes, hinders, prevents, or obstructs any person acting under and by the authority of this act, or in any way violates or assists in or is a party to the violation, is guilty on, under this, of an offense under this act, is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $15,000. So that is the penalty, regrettably, under the Old Metal and Marine Act. And then we also have the trade ordinance, which is similarly very limited in the regulation of offenses under that particular piece of legislation. Section 4 tells us that any person who commits a breach of any regulation made under this section shall be guilty of an offense and upon summary conviction for such an offense is liable to a fine not exceeding $1,000, a term of imprisonment not exceeding 12 months or both such fine and such imprisonment. So that part of what my ministry will be doing in the next six, three to six months is to review all of this legislation. We are looking at comparable legislation, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, this old legislation, but in Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, and in the United Kingdom and United States of America to bring the 1904 and 1958 legislation, which currently regulates this industry, into the 21st century so as to ensure that persons who are then apprehended under that legislation will be met with much more serious penalties. One of the other things that I have instructed the Law Reform Commission to do is to enhance and beef up the register system by which persons who trade in the industry will be required to keep a register of anybody that they are buying materials from that register will, in our day and age, will hopefully, under the new legislation, be available for inspection on a website so that everybody will know who is dealing in this trade. It will also give enhanced powers to the police to enter premises if an offense is suspected of being, in, of, of being committed, and also to be able to inspect containers which are going to be presumably the, 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 the containers in which scrap metal will be stored bef before exportation so that the idea will be that there will be a regular inspection and monitoring regime that will make sure that only legitimate lawful activity is being conducted under the new regulatory system. Okay, good day. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Uh, AG, I just want to clarify that something you said and I just want to make sure that I understand and heard it properly. You did say that the cabinet subcommittee will be reviewing the licenses. Any application that comes to the Minister of Trade and Industry for a license to export that which is now banned by the order that took effect on the 12th of August will be reviewed and approved by the cabinet subcommittee. That is to say a subcommittee consisting of the Minister of Trade and Industry, the Attorney General, Minister of National Security, and Minister of Energy, yes. Okay, so when this six-month ban expires, um, do you have, at this point in time, any plans of a different regulatory committee or anything to approve that, or is that going to be worked out within the whole regulation thing? That, that is known by the acronym WIP, Work in Progress. It is precisely that that we are looking to work out, to build out. We are going to be consulting with people in the industry we are going to be inviting them to make recommendations to us on how they consider their industry should be regulated so as to continue to be a lawful, thriving, remunerative industry. So we will be open to suggestions and we will take that into consideration in the new laws and regulations that will be worked out and rolled out after the six months and perhaps even before. 
Attorney General um, Taryn Brown from TTG again. Um, I simply want to know if you all have a sense of what size the industry, how many people be affected by this at the moment? I don't have the immediate statistics to hand. I don't know if the minister has better statistics than I do. I know that the Ministry of National Security and Public Utilities have been doing a rigorous examination of the scale of what is afoot. Um, I myself don't have those figures at hand. But I will say this, it is part of the exercise that we are going to be undertaking in the next three to six months, understanding the implications of the legislation and the reach of that legislation to legitimate and illegitimate um, activists within the industry. Hi, good afternoon. Elizabeth Gonzalez from Newsday. When the proposal was initially announced, I think it was a week or two ago, head of the Scrap Iron Dealers Association did promise to take legal action against the government. Um, now that it has been imposed, can I get a comment from UAG on that? Do you wish a comment for me on someone's intention to do something in the future? I don't know. Let's wait until it happens. And then I perhaps could make an informed comment. Okay. Um, thanks for that response. Could you also give an explanation as to why six months? An explanation as to why six months? Because we want to keep it within the shortest time possible on the recommendation which I made to Cabinet. I said that I expect we can bring the new laws and regulations into place at outside six months, and if possible, less than six months. I hope to bring it back within three months. So it's really a period of time to give us operating space within which to look at the comparative legislation across the Caribbean and outside of the Caribbean, operating space within which to consult with stakeholders in the industry. I see, for instance, Mr. Ferguson has said, and I'm, I'm hopeful, if you'll allow me this comment, that he will see the good sense of my recommending to the cabinet that I'm going to bring, hopefully, legislation and recommendations within a period of three months, because I saw one of the comments attributed to him in one of the daily newspapers that he would accept a ban of, of three months. Hi, Rashad Khan here again from Guardian Media. Um, now, I know that around two weeks ago we did have the press conference and we did speak about the government's and cabinet's intention to impose the ban. And now I'm just wondering why did we get, we have this press conference and I want to say, well, look, the ban was instituted as opposed to saying we will be instituting it on X day, you know, a retroactive as opposed to something coming up. Well, I don't know if the Minister of National Security would want to comment on that. I'll just say one very brief word, and I, and I invite the Minister, because he was present at a prior press conference with the Minister of Public Utilities. I wasn't present at that press conference, so no doubt he would wish to speak to that. But what I would say is this. It certainly is within my knowledge that there was a signal by the government that it was contemplating a ban. The ban has now been introduced, and what we've done is to call a media conference to advise the public, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, including the media, that the ban has been introduced and to invite a conversation about that. Minister, I don't know if you... I think that's quite adequate. Um, at all points, um, once we determined that this was a national security issue and threat with its implications, we indicated that we would do something promptly about it, akin to, if I may use a bit of a metaphor, akin to the medical team stopping the bleeding because the bleeding itself can have killed the patient, notwithstanding the fact of needing to treat the injury. So we decided to stop the bleeding, and we have done so. So I think it's quite happy news for Trinidad and Tobago, so we have come to pronounce it to you today, and as you heard, the surgeons now will get to work in quick order over the next three months to resolve the problem that caused the, the severe bleeding in the first place. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it appears as though you have exhausted your concerns and we are very happy to have had you. Thank you, Attorney General. Thank you, Minister. Pleasure to be here. Thank and happy to be on one of those few occasions engaging the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and members of the media. Legal Thank you. surgeon as you are. Thank you very much. Thank you.
TDT News, committed, accurate, relevant. relevant. It's His Worship, the Mayor of Port of Spain, Joel Martinez. Welcome to Pop. So we're going to have some fun. Yes, yes. Yeah, I didn't realize that you were, you know, so humorous. Well, you know, I had a serious face before, now I have a smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you how to do it.